Okay, so my next step, my current session here is advanced cloud stack troubleshooting with log analysis. Uh, again, my name is Kirk Kuczynski. I'm an escalation engineer at Citrix Systems, and previously I was working at cloud.com as a same, in the same job, the support engineer role. So I've been working on cloud stack, supporting cloud stack for about two years. So I have a little bit of experience of looking at these cloud stack logs. So agenda, uh, we're gonna be basically gonna go to introduction, what I'm doing right now going to be going over some of the key, really important log files and locations, what to look for in the log files, what to do when you think you found something that's important in the log files, and uh, then kind of the meat of the presentation, or I guess maybe the bulk or, or the most, uh, I think the most useful part will be some examples, some real world examples of looking at logs, and uh, then some Q&A. And again, as with my previous session, if you have any questions, you know, you don't have to wait until the end. I mean, you can just raise your hand and uh, flag me down and, you know, we can get the question answered. So uh, let's get started. Yeah, and plus, yeah, I mean, if you have a question, chances are someone else might have the same question. So, I mean, feel free to ask questions. So the key management server logs, well, the logs, the, key, the most important logs on the management server are all here, var log, cloud management, there's a bunch of logs in there, right? If you have ever looked in there in a cloud stack installation, you'll see a whole lot of logs. Pretty much the only one you ever care about is the management server.log. I mean, it's almost always the most important. I mean, it's al almost always the one you care about. Uh, sometimes you want to look at API server.log uh, that has the API commands as they were sent to cloud stack and uh, the IP address of who sent it. So you can find out who broke, it, who broke your cloud stack that can come in handy. And the rest, just forget about it. You know, they, they, you know maybe one out of a, a thousand times, I don't know. Some very low percentage of the usefulness of these other logs. Uh, I actually don't even know what's in some of them, so. Besides the management server having logs, there's also logs on the hypervisors. Cause, oh, you have a question? Somebody have a question? No? Sorry, okay. All right, so besides uh, the yeah, management server. There's also logs on the hypervisors. There's uh, Zen server logs and, you know, XCP, which is basically the same. And that'll be in a var log, SM log, and uh, the Zen source style log. Now, the cloud stack will mainly log into the SM log, storage manager log. And uh, for, I guess, errors that the hypervisor runs into when doing something that cloud stack told it to do, will be going to Zen source style log. You know, in most cases, and some of it will go into SM log, but uh, you know, it just depends on the error. So, but yeah, mainly the cloud stack, actual cloud stack specific logs will be in the SM log. So you can find out what cloud stack told it to do and when, and then kind of try to correlate, uh, you know, what the hypervisor did in response to that. Um, on KVM, we have, you know, th several logs, but the two important logs are the var log cloud agent agent log. That's what the cloud stack agent logs to. Uh, the note I have for that one, uh, you have to watch out for, is by default it's useless. <laughs> it's uh, logging at info level, which is irrelevant. So if you actually want to do any troubleshooting, you have to change to debug mode. So, uh, and you know, maybe that's good that it's not on uh, debug by default because it can, you know, eat up the file system pretty fast on the agents. So it just depends on uh, your environment. If you have, you know, terabyte disks and you're managing the logs really well, then you can, you know, change the debug. So you can kind of uh, do like a, a root cause analysis after the fact. So, I mean, I, I would suggest, if at all possible, change the debug. But if not, you know, then change the debug as necessary. And the other log on there is the libvert data log. Uh, cloud stack agent talks to libvirt d does every think does everything pretty much does everything it needs to do through libvirt so the libvirt d libvirt d log uh, can be helpful uh, in vSphere uh, basically vCenter logs is all you ever need there's logs a bunch of logs on the ESXi hosts but uh, I never really look at them and you never really need them usually you can find out uh, what you need from the vCenter logs now, on Zen Server and KVM, 
There's also Varlog messages. I mean, it's basically Linux um, operating system running those hypervisors. So there can be stuff that's useful on the, just the regular standard Varlog messages. And there's not really, I don't think there's an equivalent on ES6i and I never really would have to look at it anyway. Uh, especially on KVM, the Varlog messages will have libvert and QMU errors, uh, which is useful. And then also like, uh, in cases where the host rebooted, that will be in Varlog messages. Sometimes people will say, you know, why the host go down? Well, you can see, well, someone rebooted it, or you know, maybe it lost power, something like that. You can you can find that out from the Varlog messages, and uh, it's pretty helpful. Uh, other logs in the environment will be like on the SAN firewall switches, these kind of things. Uh, you can look for like permissions errors. Um, Blocked ports, for example, like if your firewall is logging uh, the kind of uh, like blocked, you know, some ports, right? Um, as far as uh, cloud set goes, we don't really support, uh, you know, helping with that, I guess. Uh, you know, cloud set, we, it doesn't really, I mean, it, it integrates to some extent in some devices, but uh, not so much in like your SAN, for example. So, uh, you know, but, but you can, you can see, you can still look at those logs and try to figure out you know, you saw an error on your hypervisor about can't mount a, you know, primary storage or something. Well, then you can look on your SAN logs or your NAS logs and say, well, it's a permissions error. You know, you didn't you didn't add the permission for the IP address of the hypervisor. So, you know, something like that. And uh, I don't have any examples of this because uh, it's just it's just too far outside of uh, not really related to cloud stack, not not directly at least. And uh, I don't have a SAN so <laughs> to, to get logs from myself. Uh, okay, what to look for in the logs? Well, there's uh, warnings, inceptions, and errors. That's uh, you know basically this line here. You know the kind of the keywords you want to look for. Um, problem is basically that these errors. <laughs> if you have a, a normal cloud sync environment, you might have a lot of these errors that's unrelated to the specific problem you're looking for. So, you know, this, especially in a larger environment, I mean. The hypervisors might go down, or you know, there can be all kinds of things going on in the environment. So, so you, you, you know, this looking for these errors is just it's just part of the puzzle, basically. You know, if you if you just grip for warn, I mean, you're just gonna have a, a long time going through those that that result of a, of a, that grip output, right? So, so you're gonna have to be able to narrow down a lot, not just a little bit. You need to really narrow it down as much as you can. So one of the things I like to look for is the VM name. You know, usually there's some kind of task the VM couldn't start or failed to stop maybe or or failed to deploy, and you know looking for the VM name actually can help uh, can help narrow down because that's very specific. And you can find the VM name and then look for the warn or errors or exceptions and stuff. So that that can be useful. Right. So, um, Cossack's really good. So, the question is about uh, how often you have a problem that's not actually having one of these, you know, warnings or, you know, some clear warn. Uh, sometimes, not too often. Occasionally, I guess, I would say. Uh, usually, there will be at least an exception, something like that. Uh, when there's like, if there's, if, yeah, basically, if there's, if there's some weird failure that you're not getting a really clean error, you'll get an exception at least. Um, you know, occasionally there'll be something that, uh, yeah, basically isn't logged at all, uh, at, even at debug level. And I'll go into that, actually. Actually, the next line, uh, trace, you know, sometimes you have to enable trace to get uh, a useful uh, error, uh, but uh, not that often. Usually it's some weird problem, basically, would be having to enable trace. Uh, the other thing to na help narrow things down on will be the type of task. Uh, basically, you, you know, you have the VM name. Maybe you're not deploying a VM or something. Maybe something. Uh, no, you know, there's not like a clear. Maybe you don't have the VM name, for example. They said, uh, you know, your your end user said, you know, I couldn't deploy a VM. And then you ask, well, what's the VM name? And I don't know. What? Well, you know, then you can't. You know, you have to scratch off the VM name. Then at least they should be able to tell you, uh, you know, what 
failed, at least I couldn't deploy a VM. So you could, you could grab for the type of task, deploy a VM or start a VM or copy a template, you know, any of these things. Uh, the one kind of hard thing, I guess, is that the task uh, name in the log is not consistent with the API commands. So like if you said, well, I did restart router, API command, and uh, you can't grip the log for restart router because it's not going to say restart router. Or maybe, maybe it does in that case, but there is a lot of, a lot of them, it's not the same. Uh, you can just figure it out, uh, or just with experience, you'll remember that, uh, you know, deploy virtual machine API command is like deploy VM in logs, or something like that. And it helps to like search, grip the logs without uh, case, you know, the dash I to grip. Uh, you can just grip and not uh, worry about the case. Because it might be very similar to API command with a different case. So that, 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 that's useful. But uh, the problem with that is it might be slow if you have like a five gigabyte management server dot log. And uh, doing case insensitive grep is going to take an hour. Um, so yeah, besides grep, uh, I actually don't even use grep that much personally. Mainly I use less. And I, I think it's just personal preference. And you can kind of just, uh, I like with less, you can kind of step through the step through the log file. With grep, grep, if you grep for things, that's the really one of the big problems with grep. If you grep for one of these important things, it's going to give you most of the important stuff, but then a bunch of the stuff, a bunch of the lines are not going to have one of those keywords. So, you know, um, I guess you can see, look at grep as kind of a starting point. You grep for the warn on VM name or something, and then, uh, then you go from there, like looking directly in the log, the raw log file with less. And, uh, then you can find, like for example, like if there's an exception, well the exception is, I have one line that tells you exception and then there's going to be like 50, like a bunch of lines of with Java uh, files, right? So without, without the word exception in that line. So what do you do there? Well, you, you need to look at the log directly. <coughs> and that gives you some funny examples. So I have, a, I have an example of that too. So we'll, we'll go into the, that into the examples. All right. Uh, yeah, enable trace, you know, sometimes there's stuff, oops, yeah, enable trace, sometimes you need to enable trace. Um, this line, if you're not paying attention, pay attention just for 30 seconds. If you ever see a void set, just don't complain w why the host is in a void set. How do I get out of the void set? Doesn't mean anything. <laughs> you have to scroll up just a little bit in the log to find the problem. The avoid set means there was a problem like 10 lines earlier. It's not the host are in the avoid set forever. And you know, you hack the database to get out of the avoid set. You have to get it. You have to read the log a little bit more to figure out, you know, the, the avoid set is just a transitory thing. It's just for that job. You know, you, you do something, it fails, the log, some, you know, some hosts are in avoid set, and then it's over, right? And then, well. You, By 10 lines, you yeah, in between 10 and, 10 and uh, you know, two gigabytes of lines, right? <laughs> yes, 10 in a month or something, right? Um, is the avoid set, is that a unavoidable, is that an unavoidable name for the error or in the log? Or is that's, that's just what the log says. It says host is in a void set. I'm, I'm yeah. wondering if we could change the log message to be more I wanted to say host in a void set. Please, please scroll up. Please, just, just stop thinking about avoid set and scroll up. I don't know, maybe that's too long, but. <laughs> so yeah, just scroll up if you see that. And is it really meant to be avoid set or avoid state? Uh, if, well, they can have, more, I, guess it's a, I guess it's a set because uh, there'll be multiple items or hosts in the avoid, like a set of them, a group uh, of them. Set. Oh, okay. Yeah, set, yeah. Yeah, I don't think there's an avoid state as far as I know. But this is, this is what you'll see in logs, avoid state all the time. I mean, I've seen everybody ask, like, why it's in there? Why is the host in the avoid set? You know, what do I do? Where, where do I click in the UI to, to, to disable it from the avoid set? So is it truly job specific then? I thought it was timeout. There was, it might, it might there be, was a cache of hosts that were in the avoid set, so the allocator wouldn't go back through. It's just for the job. And as far as I know, it's only per job. You know, as far, once that job's over, and it, yeah, I mean, as far as I know, I mean, you might still get, if you retry the error, you'll get the same avoid set error, just because it failed again and got stuck in the avoid set. I, I just wonder, what's the point of having an avoid set if you're not catching it, so that 
Well, it's, it's, it's probably cached, but probably just in memory or something. Yeah. It's just so like the job doesn't try to like deploy to the host a thousand times and fail every time. I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not uh, that uh, knowledgeable on the code, so I, I don't know the details of the void set. But uh, I just know like people always ask why it's in the void set and how do I do it, how do I fix that. So anyway, error text from UI API is really valuable because uh, you can find that in the logs, usually. <laughs> if you have like uh, error in the logs, in the, in the UI or API, of course, then yeah, it helps to start with that. And you wanna quote for this text exactly, too. And I, I'm going to go over examples, too. Uh, job ID, uh, it's a uh, you know, face palm. That uh, the job ID that the API UI gives you, well, not the UI, but the API gives you a job ID, it's not logged. Why not? I don't know. But uh, how to get the job ID? You get it from the database, or you figure it out. Right. So, uh, and so what I mean about job ID, the API, since CloudStack 3.0, there's a, uh, it's a, a UUID, that, that 36 characters, a uh, huge long string of uh, you know, text giving a, a job. And then in the logs, it's based still from the CloudStack you know, previous versions where it's a numerical ID. So the logs will have job uh, hyphen and then a number, like 200, but the API will give you job ID, you know, some, you know, GUID, right, some long thing. And that GUID's not logged and, uh, you know, maybe it would be good if it's logged, but it will be easier. It, it might save you time. And you can get it from the database uh, somewhere. I forgot where it is. I actually have an example later I can show you. I don't remember offhand where it is, but it, I think it's in my slides. Okay. Oh, actually, it is in my slides, right? In my notes. Yeah, it's in the uh, uh, async underscore job table, so you can get the uh, get the uh, get the real job ID, I guess, from the the GUID job ID. All right. And then, don't, you know, if you're not familiar with what I'm saying, you know, I'm going to have examples, you know, in a couple slides starting. So, so besides jobs, there's sequences. Uh, they're basically, you know, the job, inside of a job, you can have multiple sequences. Basically, the job, for whatever reason, needs to do something, I guess, asynchronously from the rest of the job, and we'll just send a sequence to something, like a host or a uh, uh, other management server, even, right? So, like, if you see host, like, executing request or response received in the logs for a sequence, that's basically sending it to a particular host, like a hypervisor, basically, right? And uh, for if you have a cluster of management servers and you see forwarding seek and then the ID, sequence ID, then it's actually sending that sequence to another cloud stack server to, to process it, right? And so jobs are basically uh, gonna be per job, or yeah, sequences are gonna be contained in a job, right? But then the, the sequences can actually uh, intermingle across jobs. Basically, like, if you have two jobs doing something and then they, they kick off sequences. Those sequences can uh, interfere with each other, basically, which uh, can, can be interesting when you're troubleshooting. And so basically, like, you're, if you're troubleshooting your job and the sequence, your, the sequence in the job you care about is getting stuck, it could get stuck because of sequence in some other job, right? Okay, so one more slide of information and then getting to examples, because I want to get a lot of examples into this presentation. So what to do obviously depends on the errors. Uh, there's different uh, things, different types of errors, of course. So you might get cap capacity errors. If you see something capacity related in the logs, most of the time it's gonna be something about capacity. So you can check like the hosts, make sure they have enough space on the primary storage or RAM or, or whatever. And it could be any 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 kind of resource that the cost is managing it could be like IP addresses or something. You know, it's it's not just like RAM, clearly capacity related. It's you know IP addresses or or you know things like that, right? Uh, network, uh, the logs you might have an error about like no route to host or connection refused. I mean these things pretty uh, uh, pretty much point usually to network problems. Um, so yeah. Another thing you can do is just keep waiting. Sometimes the jobs just take a long time. You know, maybe they shouldn't or maybe they should. You know, it just depends on the job and uh, just depends on the situation. So 
So, uh, you know, try to keep waiting if you can. And the next solution is to hack the database and try it again. Well, that's usually wrong. <laughs> Would not advise that, uh, but you can do that. But, uh, you know, if you have problems resulting from that, you know, don't blame, don't blame CloudStack for, for you, your hacking. Okay, so let's do some examples. Start with a very basic, kind of like the uh, nicest uh, example you can start with. You have the VM name, you have this screenshot or a quote of the text from, from the UI or the API, right? So that, 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 that's just the perfect, it's so easy, right? So you basically you grab for this, I mean, I guess maybe you can't see that well, but it says unable to create deployment for VM and then the name of the VM, right? Well, if you look, you can grab the log or even like just use less and look at the log and you find this exact error text, unable to create deployment for VM. Then you, so you, you found the job, right? Job 318. So it doesn't even matter what the API job told you. It's, it's some GUID, right? But the real job in the logs is job 318. And then, uh, then you can look in job 318 and you know, try to figure out what happened. Because usually the error message uh, will be at the end of the job. Because you know, right, yeah, the, the, uh, the job fails and the job's over. It gives you error message, right? So you find the error message and then you scroll up immediately. You stop looking below the error message and look up. And don't ignore, you just ignore the avoid set errors you get. And just scroll up and you can see no clusters found having a host with enough capacity. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's uh, yeah. It's just normal. Uh, right, yeah. It's not, it's, yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, it's no, it, it's showing the, it's showing the log of the debug, but. I mean, it's not if, like a. If it's something, if it's a cluster the allocator has chosen, why would it choose a cluster that it didn't, doesn't have a No, no, it has no cluster back. It should be a cluster. It's not a cluster. Yeah, it's not it's not cloud stack failing. It's just the job failed. Yeah, I mean, I mean, and I just did this. I mean, I just used in this example was this. There was I just used a. Uh, uh, I tried to make a VM that was too big to boot anywhere, so it wasn't. I mean, I can see your point. It could be error, but on the other hand, it's not really cloud stack failing. It's just you know the end, it's like a user error basically. So I don't know. So that, that's a beautiful solution, a beautiful case. You got the error message from the UI and the VM name even, and you can easily find the uh, job ID. So next would be avoid set. Just want to hammer this home. <laughs> why, why is the host in avoid set and how do I remove it? Oh, you stop that. You don't ask that anymore, please. So that's okay. Uh, there's not, nothing to say. I mean, this is, this is the voice errors. Uh, basically, it just means you need to scroll up in the log. And uh, you can have, even have the job ID. So it makes it easy for you. The voice that tells you, oh, well, at least the job is, you know, 17, whatever that one is. One seven, yeah. If you run into this often enough, and people are confused enough about this bug, <laughs> yeah. then it, I mean, the error needs to be different if it's throwing people so much that you're yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, you scroll up. So if you, you found found that a voice error, you know, like I don't know, a few milliseconds earlier is the real error. So in this case, it's not like a month later. It's at least at least within the same second. So that's good. And again, the, you should have like a, the job ID there. So and you can see, and this actually is an interesting example. Uh, in this case, we did grep. We had the output of a grep, not the actual log. So you can see the actual error is cut off. <laughs> Unable to set GCP entry due to, oh, nothing. No, it cut it off. There's, they must have grabbed for error or something, and uh, you know, and there's no, there's, no, there's no answer what happened, actually. So anyway. So hypervisor errors will show up in the cloud stack logs and management server dialog. In this case, we have a Zen server error. Uh, this is not too common anymore. It used to be a big problem with this uh, SR backend failure 46. And uh, my if you get my slides, there's a solution. It's like 
four steps, right, to, to fix the SR. But you can see, I mean, it's just, if you see this kind of thing, I mean, it's straight from the hypervisor. So it's like CloudSec failing because of something happened on hypervisor. So there's nothing CloudSec can do. You know, just fail. the hypervisor, you know, couldn't do it, do what it, uh, it was trying to do. Probably in this case, the starting a VM. So, yeah, just to, you know, if you get this kind of thing, then you, you got to uh, check the hypervisor next. And you know, I'm not going to pick on Zenserver. I'm a equal opportunity uh, uh, presenter. I'm going to pick on them all. So next we have uh, error from KVM. Managing server.log. Uh, we have this crazy U mount error in the managing server.log. Device is busy. Like, what is all this? I don't know. So we check varlog messages on a, a hypervisor. And there's more craziness. And actually, I didn't have the, the, uh, all the logs from Varlog messages, but this, this is the one I had. It's, uh, there's another, there will be another, in this example, there was another message about file not found, and that's actually a bug in libvirt. So uh, the solution in this one was you touch that file that libvirt can't find for some reason. And it's fixed in, uh, it's fixed in 094 libvirt. So. This particular one, but this this just gives you an example of uh, finding the error. You know, you have the vengeance for the log, you have the U mount error. I mean, you can kind of see the like, libvirt exception. I mean, it's clear from libvirt. It's nothing about cloud stack. So then you can go in varlog messages, or you can probably check something similar in libvirt.d, find something. Oh yeah, and uh, here's some uh, VMware. And then you know, create command failed, and like some message about this. Like, what is all this? You know, in this case, I would say, you know, go bug VMware, because this is probably VMware bug, I guess. The, this, in this, this particular log, it's because the, the path is too long. <laughs> the path, this, uh, this HTTPS path is too long, because uh, whatever, vCenter doesn't like a path that's too long. So the solution is rename the SR. <laughs> <laughs> to be to remove because the cloud stack will rename the SRs or not the SRs the, the data stores in, in, v in vSphere the, the the data stores uh, cloud stack will name them with a GUID with hyphens but sometimes those extra four hyphens just makes vCenter keel over and uh, doesn't like it so in this case we we, we delete, delete the hyphen name the hyphens from the uh, the data store name and fixed it so yeah and uh, yeah so yeah just watch out for that. But I mean, again, it's just an example, like what kind of things you might see from the hypervisor making its, the, the error from my hypervisor making its way into CloudStack. So exceptions are, you know, what you will see uh, for some problems, you know, maybe, I don't know percentage, but a, a good chunk of percentage, a good chunk of the time you'll have an exception of some kind of error. And, uh, you know, I'm not a, a really good at the code, so I don't really know. Uh, that much about looking at exceptions. I just know like looking at the first few lines of the exception are the, the valuable information. So we see like unavailable to acquire lock on a storage pool and then something about template manager and then some database and then some things I don't know what it is. So in this case it's probably something related with the template. So then we can ask the ask the ask the you know end user or whoever did this to my cloud stack, uh, ask them what they did and why and how, how they do it. And uh, in this case, the problem was uh, cloud stack, uh, uh, they were trying to deploy like 10 VMs at once from a new template and cloud stack didn't like it. And so, I mean, this is a bug, I think. So uh, I, I would uh, think this, this case is still open. So it, 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 I don't know if it's filed yet, but it will be filed because cloud stack shouldn't get an exception when, it's, when you're just deploying 10 VMs. Okay, so forwarding sequences, you see that uh, this, like I said earlier, forwarding sequence number. And basically, this cloud stack server is sending this job or this, actually, this sequence, it's sending this sequence to another <coughs> cloud stack uh, server in a cluster. Now, in this case, we have Picard, he's, he's like saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, why? So I see this forwarding message when I only have one cloud stack server. Uh, yeah, that was the case. We only had one cloud stack server, and we checked the database, and there was duplicate entries for the management server ID. So the cloud stack server was just forwarding everything to itself, and as you can imagine, it didn't work. <laughs> it, 
It was interesting. The UI, you, can, you couldn't, I think you couldn't, lo I think you could log on to the UI, but then you couldn't do anything else. And so we just deleted the, the, the extra entries in the, in the, in the database. But uh, it, was a, it was a weird one. And uh, in, the engineering said, it's not supposed to happen. It can never happen. <laughs> it costs like three and, and above. It used to be a problem in the previous versions, but not in, not in three, it's fixed. Uh, anyway, it was, this was from Cossack 3. All right. So a trace example, and like your example, like why, um, you know, when you don't see something, like a, obviously an error, right? So in this case, we had the, the there was an error in the UI, but uh, just to, you know, we couldn't figure it out, basically. They were taking a snapshot of a volume, right? So the trace snapshot, you can see, uh, right, all right, right. And so in this example, we have the trying to create a snapshot, and they are, uh, uh, we have the volume, which snapshot they're trying, which, which volume they're trying to snapshot. So we're looking at volume 4,500 and a snapshot. So you can see in this uh, async job submission, we can see create snapshot command, which is good. And uh, the, the volume ID is somewhere in here. Uh, I could have sworn. Yeah, volume ID 4,500. So, so yeah, with that information, with, with, with you know, some of the information, you can find out uh, you know, what, what the, the end user is talking about, why it failed. But then there was no error. There, wasn't, there was a problem in the logs. Uh, I would think there's a bug. We, we enabled trace, we have to enable trace to get the, the text that was in the UI. You know, I don't know why that, I mean, that should be at least debug, I guess, but uh, the internal error was logged at trace only, so. In that case, we had to enable trace. Um, not really, but, uh, you know, this is just an example of why you would need trace. Like, if you want to see the error that you, the end user is getting. Does it show up in the API block? Uh, it probably would, yeah. But uh, uh, I, I was enabling trace to try to get some more information about the error in general. I just, I, I include this entry just to, because it's something useful, logged only at trace. Uh, and then, right, yeah, the, the next, uh, the next actually is the same error, the same problem. It, uh, the actual error didn't require trace. There's, there's an exception, we got an exception. There's uh, active snapshot tasks on the instance, same instance. So they were doing two snapshots at once. Um, well, according to the log, they were doing it. They were doing it. They were trying to snapshot a VM that was already being snapshot at the same time. Uh, actually, that wasn't really what happened in this one, because uh, there was some kind of bug or something that the, the snapshot was in the wrong state, was stuck in the the transitory state that says it's being created. So, yeah. But but normally you would get. I guess you would get this if you're snapshotting a VM and then try to snapshot again real quick. So yeah, I mean, you didn't really, yeah, I'm sorry about, this is not the best example to show why you would use trace, but uh, you, in this one, you didn't need trace exactly, but uh, there was some information at, at trace level that was useful. So like I had mentioned earlier, one of the things you wanna do is be patient, for God's sakes, just, just, just slow down a little bit sometimes and just go get a coffee or something. So in this case, I'm just gonna go step, I mean, you don't need to, care about all these lines, really. I'm just gonna step through what the, what the lines mean, right? So you see at uh, 11.31 and 59 seconds, they de someone deployed a VM, right? And then, you know, 10 seconds later, 11.32 and 10 seconds, the template starts being transferred, right? So that happened, right? And then the admin, he didn't even, I mean, th these are just end user doing something. He's deploying a VM. And then the admin decided to reboot a virtual router at 12.13, uh, so like, uh, you know, like half an hour, oh geez, 40 minutes later, while that template is still being copied, he's trying to reboot a router. So 12.13.06, he reboot a router. In 12.13.06, we see this, waiting for seek, sequence, right? Stop command is being scheduled for the reboot the router. And so at 12.41, that template finally transferred over successfully. And then the virtual router reboot can actually be done. <laughs> and it takes like, it takes four seconds. <laughs> I don't know why, but you know, 
but I don't know why I wait for you know 40 minutes to uh, to actually send the job that took four seconds. But anyway, that's what I did. So in this case, you know, the administrator was very good about being patient and said, "Well, I'm, I rebuilt the router, but I'm going to wait and just see what happens." But you know, that's not all admins. You know, some admins have uh, some web browsing to do or something and can't wait. So in this case, they were doing a destroy router. So at 9.05, they destroy router. And 9.05, immediately, CloudStack sends the destroy router command to one of the hosts. In this case, it was a KVM host, right? Host 57. And it finished 40 minutes later. Well, that took a long time to destroy a virtual router. So what the heck was going on here? So what, well, we, we say, you know, why did the host took 40 minutes to, re to destroy the router? Well, we checked the log on the virtual router, the agent log is a good example. During the time that they were trying to reboot, destroy the router, uh, there was some connectivity problems. Probably their switch was down, who knows? The NIC had problems, I don't know. Couldn't contact the management server, so obviously you can't do any jobs, can't run anything. And so, yeah, didn't, the host, the host actually, this is still agent log, you know, until like, you know, 9.44, uh, it actually got the job and uh, succeeded within, uh, you know, immediately, you know, a few milliseconds. But the, the admin's not that patient. So 20 minutes after the first destroy router, they hacked the database, re-ran destroy router. Double face palm, right? So, yeah. And guess what happened? There's already destroy router sequence or queued up. So <laughs> the second one is, is waiting, right? And then the sequence is, uh, the first one actually finished, and then the second one is sent, and then GWiz, it can't run it, it's already deleted. So, yeah. I mean, in this case, uh, you know, it was useful to look at agent.log because to figure out well, what happened, and also look, useful to look at management server.log because you know, why the admin took the actions they did and why they, uh, you know, uh, why, uh, what they said, what they said was, you know, they, they hacked the database after 20 minutes and then it worked, right? Well, it didn't actually work. If you check the logs, you have physical evidence that what they did didn't work. It says right here, they hacked the database, they uh, waited, you know, a little bit longer and then it failed, but because the first one actually succeeded. So anyway, just be patient there. So sometimes you have some weird anomalies, I would call them, in the log entries. So last time, there's no alien abductions of CloudStack servers that we've seen ever. Uh, so basically, last time would be gaps, huge gaps in the, uh, in the CloudStack logs, right? So basically, if your CloudStack log is skipping one second, then there is a major problem. There's not going to be one second of downtime in the CloudStack with debug, right, ever. I mean, maybe, maybe if it's not doing anything Maybe it's just CloudStack installed with no hypervisors. It's going to be no entries for a second. But in all case, any kind of real environment is going to be millions every second. Uh, the other weird problem, you might have the entries out of log, out of order in the log. So like the time, non-sequential time. So CloudStack doesn't travel backwards in time, doesn't like reverse, like doesn't like hit some problem and say, oh, well, I'm going to go backwards for a while and try to fi fix it. No, it doesn't work like that. And then zero bytes management for the log is never <laughs> going to be, ever, never, never going to happen. Not even for like a tenth of a second, right? So yeah, like um, zero bytes is probably disk is full, right? Which can happen. And then the last time or out of order log entries, uh, usually some, like some kind of server load problem, like uh, who knows what happened, something happened. Uh, the case that you know, made me think about these uh, things was uh, they were losing their management server. It was becoming inaccessible for 10 minutes every day at midnight. So like, what the heck is that? Why is that happening? And every day at midnight, they, 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 the cost is basically down. I mean, it's running, but it's uh, down. I mean, not, not accessible. And so looking at logs, we had these problems, the lost time and out of order. And, uh, Looking at it a little bit closer, we f I found that uh, the logs were like, the API server.log was like four gigs a day. Manager server.log was like six gigs a day. And so at midnight, when they're rotating, it's blowing up the server, g-zipping those files. 
And so, so, I mean, if you're gzipping like those, you know, 10 gigs of stuff, it's going to slow down your server. But I mean, that's just an example. I mean, you can have high load for other reasons too, but, uh, but yeah, if you, if you see this, it's definitely something weird happening. And so yeah, in that case, I told them to rotate every hour because, you know, cutting those one gig, 10 gigs of compression files, you know, over 24 hours is not too bad. So nearby entries, sometimes, uh, well, basically it's not helpful because there's just going to be so much going on in the logs. You see an error, and then like the line before it is completely unrelated normally. But I mean, sometimes you can kind of look for like something that's at least a little bit related. Uh, so like in this case, there's an error. They, you know, they, they restart the, the cloud stack, and uh, the uh, the VMs are HA is being triggered on like five VMs for some reason. Like, what what the heck is that about? I mean, I just restarted cloud stack, and now it's triggering HA. Uh, well. You can kind of find something nearby. You know, here it's like within, you know, one tenth of a second, less like one one uh, yeah one tenth of a second or so away. You see, at least this error is kind of related. It's the same as like the VM VM ID is one two four three five. So this line has one four one two four three one two four two three. So yeah, it's kind of similar and it's kind of related. And this was like this was a bug. There's some. There's some stale stuff in the database. And uh, yeah, any questions? You have a question? And I can go back over any other examples or go over more details or anything you want. Are you seeing anyone doing log aggregation? Um, like do that. Splunk or Bray log? Yeah, so log aggregation like Splunk or something like that? Uh, I think some customers using Splunk or similar products. Uh, just a lot of logs, so uh, it's going to be a lot of information for your log server to take. The log level? Uh, right, yeah, there's a file, log4j uh, configuration file. Uh, it's in my slides, I think. So if you, if you, have, if you get the slides, there should be like a one of the, in the notes, I think there's like a, the, the, the uh, yeah, uh, to enable trace logging, you edit, uh, on the management server, it's slash etc, slash cloud, slash management, log for j dot, uh, dash xml, dot conf, and you change the category, com dot cloud, to trace, instead of debug, and it's very similar on the KVM agent, it's just like, uh, etc cloud agent, log for j, probably, Something, something along those lines, and you can change to debug from info level. Yeah, right. Yeah, you don't need to restart. You, when you edit the log for J, then uh, then CloudSec will just pick it up within you know ten seconds or something. Yeah, it should be very, very, very fast. So you you can kind of just like then tail the log and look for the trace entries to start logging, and then then start digging into it. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, sure. So aside from like the talk like this, uh, what would you suggest as a motivation to learn about how to be awesome troubleshooters and the process? Yeah, uh, well check the documentation for sure. It has a lot has a lot of uh, good information. <laughs> <laughs> You can get, the thing is about the troubleshooting is you can uh, get uh, information, I mean there's the dedicated troubleshooting section which is kind of short I guess, but, uh, but you know if you're, under, if you're familiar with, the, with like the rest of the documentation like reading about the product in general, you kind of know, you know where to look I think besides uh, just having like a formal troubleshooting stuff to, to look at because uh, you know I mean, and you know I guess the knowledge base has some stuff too. Yeah, the Citrix knowledge base and uh, the uh, Apache wiki. Uh, it's like wiki, right? And, uh, oh, and the forums too, right? There's the buildacloud.org forums, I think. Has a lot of uh, um, 
well, it used to. The, I think it still has the same content as it used to before it was migrated. So uh, that has a lot of information about troubleshooting. So yeah, I mean, troubleshooting is uh, always like uh, kind of hard to uh, to learn. It's kind of like you learn by doing, essentially. So, so yeah, I mean, if you're, <laughs> I guess if you're installing CloudStack, you're going to be learning to troubleshoot. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, because you install it, and if it works, then you know you should apply for a job at uh, Citrix <laughs> first time, I guess. <laughs> no, I'm just you know exaggerating a little, but uh, you know normally if, if you inst I mean even I install, I, I, you know you make mistakes, you make a typo, like like one time I was installing and you know you typed the wrong URL for the the system VM template creation, and then like. Doesn't boot, so then you have to figure it out. So I mean, it, it's just to make it happen to anybody. It's just, to, it's, a, it's kind of, I guess it's a complicated installation and uh, complicated to manage. So uh, I mean, as long as you're using it for a, you know any length of time, you're just going to probably run into some scenarios where you need to fix it. And uh, you know, of course, you can check the Apache IRC and mailing lists uh, to ask for advice. But uh, you know, hopefully with like a some of this information, you can look at the logs yourself and uh, you know, at least don't complain about the avoid set. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yeah. Sure when somebody pops in the IRC, email this guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, don't. <laughs> Do you follow the specific request so you can, because I, I guess someone can see that most of the errors you are facing can eventually be transformed in better error messages in the product or yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's Apache. The, you can just file bugs for it. Uh, you know, if you're paying a Citrix customer, then we can escalate directly to some of the, the Citrix-funded, uh, uh, you know, developers. But uh, you know, it's open source. I mean, you can a you can fix it yourself, submit a patch, or or you can uh, you know use the community resources or filing bugs. Okay. Yeah. For the what? Apache uh, chainsaw. Yeah. Apache chainsaw? Oh, I don't know what that is. I'm sorry. Okay. Chainsaw. Uh, this is like yeah, I don't know. I'm not familiar with it. Oh, like a like a okay, kind of like a Splunk type thing, sort of. Yeah, I mean you can I mean you can use some of like the the, the things I had mentioned early on about what to grip for and stuff uh, as like preventative me measures. Uh, wherever it was, but like, uh, uh, yeah, here. So like, if you're doing some kind of like log analysis or something, you have some tools, Blunk or like Chainsaw, I guess. Uh, you can, you know, you can look for these and have alerts on these, and uh, you know, I don't know how effective it will be, but. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I use grep or less normally. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I mean, if you have proactive things, you'd look for the errors a ahead of time, and maybe like, if you're really, I would probably narrow it down to like specific type of errors. Like, if you care about like deploy VM failed, then you can you know combine like the error with the type of task. So you have alerts on very. You you don't want to have alerts on like Warren or something because you won't be able to sleep. If you have a pager, I guess, then uh, you want to like narrow it down as much as you can. So, yeah. Any other, any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Thanks.